right, let's uh, jump into our agenda review. Don't forget to put your uh, name uh, as an attendee uh, in the agenda document here. I'll post a link uh, to it here in the chat. Um, uh, there we go. So please uh, put your name there, let us know that you were here. And um, let's review the agenda, take a couple seconds to look at the agenda, see if there's anything that was missed, uh, anything that you'd like to add. Um, so we'll uh, wait about 30 seconds and then we'll um, solidify the agenda. All right, what do folks think? Is there anything you want to add, remove, modify? Oh, looks like we've got Dusty here today, so let me change that. Okay, let's uh, jump into it. So we are actually, uh, we're not doing introductions anymore. Um, if folks maybe identify themselves the first time that they speak, that's always helpful, just so that people can put a name to a face. Um, and uh, Vadim is out today. Uh, there's a note here about uh, vSphere over uh, installs in 4.7 should be fixed. Um, and older Fedora Core OS should be used due to that FCOS bug. And um, without Vadim here, that actually takes out a chunk of some of the things that I wanted to talk about. But let's bounce over instead to Dusty for some Fedora Core OS updates. Take it away, Dusty. Hey everybody. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I don't have a whole lot. Um, I'm kind of standing in for Timothy this week. I would love to come every week. I just uh, don't often find the time. Um, but what I would like to say is uh, Timothy mentioned to me that he wanted me to bring up uh, the fact that the DNF counting support is now going to be default in Fedora Core OS. Um, so on our testing stream, uh, we just rolled it out. So basically when nodes do updates, um, it it pings our server and there's a unique ID and stuff that uh, that we can kind of start to see how many people are actually using Fedora Core OS. It's completely optional, so it can be opted out of, um, but it's very similar to what Fedora is already using uh, for workstation, server, cloud, et cetera, uh, for kind of, getting some sort of numbers. If you've ever seen Matthew Miller give his state of Fedora talk, you've seen graphs, and uh, that's where all of that information kind of plugs in. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Just an FYI there, if you uh, if you don't want to opt in, then basically you can opt out. Um, and I'll put a link to that stuff there. Uh, since Vadim and here, I'm not sure exactly, um, you know, when that'll roll out to OKD, uh, but should be at some point in the future. Thank you, Dusty. And um, moving on to a docs update, uh, Brian, you wanna you wanna chime in with uh, the state of uh, OKD.io? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so I've created a beta site. Um, Diane, we might need your help there getting someone to turn on the GitHub pages for the OpenShift site. So. Um, I don't have access to the settings tab, so someone needs to go in the settings, go to the pages tab, and just enable it to pages on the beta branch, and then the site should just pop up. It's the root of the beta branch, and then the beta site should just pop up 
serve from GitHub pages. Um, so that is basically what I had on my personal repo. What I'm currently working on is moving the home page so the content is in Markdown and we stylize it. It's not going to be as fancy as what's there with all the animations and all that stuff, but it means that the content will be updatable in Markdown and you don't have to go into the template and write all the CSS and the HTML to get it to, to look good. So I'm doing that. And then it's really going to be a question of getting community feedback in terms of what color schemes do we want. I'm trying to go with light and dark. So we've got two different color schemes, one light and one dark. And um, it's really then where do we want the menu? How do you want the menu to be structured? What color schemes we want? What styling we want? And then once you've agreed all that, just then make sure we have all the content moved across into the beta site. And when everyone's happy with that, we can flip it over into um, production. Um, and for those who don't know, we're adopting a technology which takes pure markdown with a couple of extensions to convert the static site. So rather than middleman, where you need to be more of a front-end web developer to actually modify content, we're moving to a model where it's pure markdown. Um, and we're going to use GitHub Actions. So a Git push to the main branch would have, will actually trigger an update to the site. So we don't need any sort of additional pipeline help from within Red Hat. We can sort of be a bit more um, dynamic with altering the content. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Diane, yeah, you have something. I'm muted, of course, um, talking to myself. So, Brian, I will reach out to you in Slack and walk through all of that. I may have privileges. I doubt it that I have the privileges to do to do what you've asked me to do. Um, but I, I, I know people. Um, so I, will, I know a person who knows a guy um, who can get that done for us today, hopefully. Um, basically, basically, anybody that goes in and has the settings icon will be able to do it. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I know someone who has that. Um, hopefully he's not on vacation. Um, actually, one of them had just had a baby, so he may be on PTO. Um, so we'll figure out who that is. The other thing is um, I, I have an, a, a resource, a third party resource that works for me on other projects that um, if we trained him up can help um, with color schemes, making things beautiful. Um, he has more skills than my MS Paint skills. Um, so um, I'll reach out to you, Brian, and introduce you to him, um, and we'll see. And he's also, I think, a good litmus test for if we've got enough documentation for everybody on how to how to successfully update this stuff. So I'm going to see if I can um, repurpose him from doing some stuff on uh, the Commons website and get him to to help with this transition. Um, and you know, it's it's a paid resource, so. Um, you know, that's, that's also helpful and, and get him involved as well. So hopefully that will help us move a little bit more quickly to, to getting this done. Because um, trust me, I would like to get off the uh, current situation as soon as possible and make this more community oriented. Um, so let's, let's see if we can do that and I can do that offline um, with you and via Slack and everything else. So um, that's, that was my update on where I can help you guys out. Awesome, thank you, Diane. And uh, another thing that came up, Vadim isn't here, so we can't really tackle it at the level that I wanted to, is um, documents group uh, talking again about breaking down and moving the different components of the README. Brian has done that to some extent already in terms of the menu choices that he set up uh, in the beta. Um, and so once that's visible to everybody um, and once folks have had a chance to play around with it, then we can actually turn the README in the OKD repo to just a basic README with links to all of the different components and different uh, ideas as opposed to trying to do it all <laughs> right there and put it all in, in one document. I do want Vadim to be a, um, I think it, it's, it would be beneficial to us to have Vadim chime in from an engineering standpoint and from the, as the sort of maintainer of the repo as it were, 
um, with his input on that. And regrettably, he hasn't been at this meet. He was not at this one, and he hasn't been in, at, wasn't at the last one. So um, we'll we won't be moving forward with that completely until we sort of get to the dean, um, get some feedback from him on that. Yeah. Um, the other thing is um, how to ask questions. This is. Uh, if you look, there was a pinned comment by Vadim in the OpenShift users channel. Um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think what day it was. It was the 27th at 5.07 a.m. Let me copy this here uh, and paste it. But in short, uh, Vadim did a good job of um, sort of laying out what is helpful and what is not helpful in terms of questions. And uh, let me post this here. And I added a, a little tidbit that I thought was helpful and he agreed with that. And it'd be nice to actually get this as like maybe a small document. I don't know of any resource that's, there's always the general, and I can't remember the website off the top of my head, the how to ask questions. Uh, uh, there's like a website that actually like elucidates how to do this. It would help Vadim and other uh, folks who are doing support stuff in the channel and, uh, um, and the other places where people have been showing up in the discussions or whatever, to be able to reference something that's a, a document that says, here's what we need. You know, when you're asking for help, you know, we need your, your log, you know, we need what version um, that you're running, we need to know what provider that you're on. Must gather is like, you know, Vadim, probably 80% of the questions that he goes to respond to, he has to ask for people to provide a must gather. And that takes a lot of time and it delays the, our ability to help other people as well. So I think the docs group will, will um, tackle this probably at the next meeting. If folks have suggestions, feel free to um, shoot an email over the, uh, uh, working group email list or throw something in the chat or if you want to say something right now if you'd like to add something um, but I think this would be really helpful for supporting people the best that we can as well. Any feedback on that? Okay. No feedback uh, maybe that means that's a good idea or a really bad idea I do not know. Um, <laughs> right. um, and then uh, training materials uh, for doc support resource. Um, that's something that uh, basically the idea is to have um, something that we can get folks to do doc support continuously over time coming up with that. Um, docs group will be tackling that if folks have input on that. Um, feel free to shoot something out over there. Uh, moving on to issues. Um, are there any issues that folks wanted to bring to our attention in the issues list? Uh, here is uh, issues list here. And I didn't see anything that stood out as being need, uh, as needing discussion. Um, other than uh, I just noticed that I don't think anyone responded in terms of the CRC questions, um, so we can respond to those with the new build that um, Charo did uh, last week, which I think resolved uh, all the outstanding issues. Anything else in the issues that folks wanted to, to pull out and talk about? Just just to double check, that's the one that um, you, you update the OKD based CRC build 786 that you're talking about. Yeah. And that's. Yep. By ProtoSam. I believe is... that that was done. So I'll check and see, but I believe that that was done. Um, is this one that keeps happening each time we put out a new release? Is there something we can automate here? Uh, there is, and um, this is something that when we do the automation will be resolved. So when we do come up with an automated solution, 
um, and modify some of those build scripts and stuff, um, this will be resolved. And there's another CRC ticket that is Yeah, so it's those two actually. So by Josh Core, which is the Shah, and then build. So 808 and 786, we can update those. Anything else on issues? All right, let's move to discussion items. Were there anything in the discussion items that folks wanted to discuss? Um, I'll just note that Vadim's strategy of getting folks to do discussion instead of issues is actually turning out to be really wise because a, a fraction of what comes in is actually issues with the code base in any fashion. A lot of it is just education or directing folks to other resources or whatever. Nothing really came in. I did want to, and Vadim isn't here, so I didn't put it um, on here, but you'll notice in um, discussion 784, and I'll put a direct link to it. Um, it's a technical discussion, so I don't want to have it without Vadim or maybe Christian or someone here. But basically, Eduardo ended up writing a, a very detailed document that, um, I don't know, that, you know, it wasn't put in this ticket, but um, Eduardo had a couple tickets open and ended up actually writing a document about their evaluation of OKD for um, the company that he works for and why they didn't choose it. And so my thought was, at, I guess we'll do it at the next meeting if Vadim is able to show up or Christian, is to work through some key points of that document to determine um, what feedback we can run with and and improve uh, the offering versus something that's just the nature of the beast um, versus something that we'd like to do but we just don't have the resources to do. Did anyone else get a chance to to look at that um, document that Eduardo posted? Yeah, I think I think wasn't he wasn't he the the user that was trying to do things with changing the base domain yes that was one of the things yeah yeah he, he had a usage model that didn't fit kubernetes and OpenShift. right in in the way that the the roots and the base domain was doing it um so i i think that might be part of it i haven't actually just reading through i, I i've read the document but trying to work out what are the bits he was specifically saying um, were the problem um, and, and what didn't fit. But I, I seem to remember we had several discussions around he was trying to change the base domain um, and was having difficulty um, coming up with the model that he wanted in terms of um, getting sort of work coming in through a firewall or something or through some external router. Yeah, and I think he wanted to have multiple clusters serviced under one FQDN. And and the way that he wanted to do it, he didn't want... Um, I think it was the either way around. He, he wanted multiple domain names served by the same cluster. Right. And it was things like the OAuth endpoint that, right. yeah. that, that, that couldn't be changed to support yeah. multiple domains. So yes, I think there was something with the model that didn't quite fit the way that, if you do it the way that OpenShift and OKD wants it to do, it works. And I think there was a model that didn't work. Yeah. And that's something where um, there's just a built-in limitation there. And it used to be that you could change the console URL, but now you can't change it. I think you can, once, Actually, I don't think you can work around that. I think actually the console URL, you have to rely on using that long URL because the authentication 
bounces. Or no, actually, there is a parameter that you can set to where you get. You can still change the console. You can, you can still change the web console URL. Um, however, what you can't change is um, if you want to serve multiple. Um, if you want to do a multi-tenant OpenShift from a single OpenShift cluster, which is essentially, I think, what his use case was, and I think it's actually a fairly valid use case, um, OpenShift itself, like the 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 add-on components that make up OpenShift and OKD, of course, um, don't support this. So uh, Kubernetes does, because you don't actually have to have the web console in Kubernetes itself. And so what you can do is you can deploy Kubernetes and then deploy multiple instances of web consoles and, and have each web console deployed with a different set of things. And so it can look multi-tenant with a single cluster manager. Um, the route that Red Hat has taken for this is they're using OCM to do this as Red Hat advanced cluster management through Kubernetes. However, that is currently non-functional on OKD. So without that working on OKD, there's basically no multi-tenant path for for open sh for for OKD right now. So um, OCM is um, about to go into the sandbox at CNCF, um, and I, I know a person, um, a bunch of them. Should I be bringing the OCM people here to the OKD working group? Sometime yes. in the not too distant future. Okay. That I, so Dan, I this heard. is actually something that my team. Uh, so at, at Data, we're also very interested in this for a similar reason. Mm -hmm. We want to we want to um, basically on demand multi tenant um, for spinning up tiny dev clusters whenever they need it in developer environments. We also want to orchestrate prod and staging from the same systems, and we want them to be essentially centrally managed as much as reasonably possible. And it looks like the OCM stuff is the way to do that, but um, there doesn't seem to be a way to use it with OKD, which is let's, kind of where we want to go for the dev let's stuff. Let's pull back a little bit and actually say what OCM is for people who are going to be Open watching Cluster the video. Management, oh, which sorry, is an upstream project mm -hmm. for Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes. God, that's a mouthful. Uh, <laughs> we are really bad at um, naming things. Um, so, anyways, just enough said. But the right. um, but the OCM folks, um, and I don't know if Dato, if if anyone at Dato has reached out to the OCM group. They have community meetings as well. So that might be uh, Juliana Su is um, the engineering lead and sort of the community um, lead for that initiative. And it's basically what they are is open sourcing. Um, advanced cluster management because we open source everything we acquire, um, and yeah, the good people at Staff Rocks are. are right, we to... found out that OCM was fully open sourced um, three days ago because I saw a, a YouTube video that said, "Yeah, we made a new RHACM release. It is open source now." Uh, and they pointed us to a website, and I went and looked at it, and it's like not complete. Like the the yeah, the deployment it's... is not complete. Yeah, it's still like a the work code's all there, but the deployment's not. They, oh, and, and I mean, my colleague Dan Axelrod is now here, which means hi. He's yeah, no, I've, I've been here the whole time. Um, hi, Daniel Axelrod, also from Datto. Uh, I've been at a, a few of these before. Um, no, we have not uh, reached out to OCM um, directly yet. That's that's a good contact. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure that yeah. uh, that we have that conversation. Thank you. Yeah, no, let's let's please do that because they are applying for sandbox status in the CNCF right now. And so the more external voices that are like, hey, this is a good thing, will help them. So they will listen, because um, they will listen anyways. Julian is great. Um, so let, let's do that. And, and, I, and I have had a conversation with them about making it work with OCM, uh, OKD. Um, and it's just, it's a bandwidth issue. It's always a bandwidth issue um, for folks. So. Um, let's see if we can't do that. Is anyone from Dato by any chance going to KubeCon North America in person? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I don't know of I anything will, yet. <laughs> I will likely attend virtually. Um, but yeah, I yeah, just, I, 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 doubt I, I don't know. Going. Like it, everything is everything is woolly and pending all other things, and it's. Yeah, I just, maybe if anyone, so 
I think I think it is. It's like since most of all of us are remote, like what I'm always looking for is people who are in the vicinity of Los Angeles, because yeah. um, those probably would be the only people who are allowed in the country or in the state at that juncture. Who knows? Who knows to participate? Yeah. Um, we have a colleague that lives in that area, but I don't. I, that doesn't necessarily mean we can like send them to it. But um, that that being said, like it would be great if Diane, you could hook us up with uh, a contact with the OCM team, and then. Dan and I can start talking with them about it um, provisionally. Uh, like, uh, I'm not saying this with like any particular guarantees, but I think provisionally we could try to rest, wrangle up some uh, ability to test OCM on OKD um, in our in our environment to see you know how well it works and and like give feedback um, to the team if, if that's something that they're looking for. Um, can't really commit to anything yet because like. Uh, everything's kind of like up in the air, but that certainly is something that we care about enough that we're super interested in that we would, um, that, you know, we can try to make some openings to, to try to, to try to do that if it's wanted. Yeah, no, it's definitely wanted. And I was just going to say also in, at the Commons event, um, if Dato shows up, um, we'll, we're doing a whole series of lightning talks in the afternoon. So those may be virtual. We have no idea yet, but, um, well, I'll um, see you there. I'm, I'll, I'm making a note to connect you to Juliana. So, thank you. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to put a link to. Um, I'll put it in discussion items. Uh, Eduardo's uh, OKD bare metal install um, instructions slash critique. Uh, and then we'll bump that uh, to the next meeting to, to delve into that a little bit. And I think it's just, um, I think it's good practice. Like if we get feedback, particularly if someone goes and, uh, and takes the trouble to write out something so detailed of an analysis of, of OKD as an option um, to take that feedback and at least look it over and, and um, demonstrate some, uh, some, some response to that, right? Um, so we'll do that next time around. Uh, code, ready, code ready containers status. Um, the event was a success, it seems like. We had uh, at one point 20-some um, odd people uh, logged in for it, um, which I think for a live event on a Friday afternoon is, is a, a good thing, or Friday morning for some. Uh, what's, what kind of feedback uh, have you, do you have or have you heard about the event? Did it get us anybody else to help build DRCs? That's that's my question. I, you know, or what is the next step to make enable someone other than Charo to make a to build and release a CRC container for OKD? That that to me is the the measure of success. Right. This has got people maybe interested. It sounded like the next step was more documentation. Right then. Yes, um, and so the I mean, documentation. Oh, good. So I know that. From our perspective, we're tentatively interested in being able to in, in doing that. Um, certainly, something that is kind of a concern is the fact that this has not been automated before. Um, I think something that we could possibly do is, if there is interest in like automating the de the build and release of that, this is something that we might be able to help with because it would be useful for us as well. Because what I think we would want to do. Um, you know, just speaking for myself, having to work with OKD stuff at Datto, something that we have for our own workflow is that we actually spin up um, simple clusters that we can run as a VM on our computer to to stage and test the new version and test our our um, our workloads and stuff on it to make sure that the features are there and the stuff like that works before we actually deploy into production because deploying a production cluster is such a pain in the butt and such a lot of work that it, it's much easier for us to be able to um, be able to do localized testing basically on demand uh, to to do that. And since we don't have uh, and so CRC seems to be like the path to be able to do that um, for that with OKD4, then we need to we, we would want to be able to to build that continuously with newer nightlies or whatever based on whatever we're trying to figure out. So the the open question at this point is um you know how difficult is it to replicate you know what you know any missing documentation needs to be filled in uh depending on 
no conversation with Charo and us and whatever. But also the final step is asking the question of why was this never automated? Because like everything else about the OpenShift deployment process, the OpenShift build and release process is automated, but CRC somehow isn't. That is a little weird to me in the first place. So I don't I don't get what, what happened there. So having looked at the documentation um it's not hard at all and i mean and, and if you follow what's there uh it appears to be pretty easily ci right um uh, my sense is that we could actually do a process and that automation process and um make that process available so make the scripts available that we use to do that etc and make the whole thing open um, we can ask Charo. My sense is that um, he might have an answer. Uh, we asked Charo about why it was neglected in terms of a automated build, but I don't know that. I don't know that there's a technical reason, right? If, if yeah, we, like because there's a Fedora Jenkins that could just do this on like let's say a weekly or monthly basis, that you know we can just pop it in there, have it run the job, and then. Fedora Infra can just make sure that the artifacts are auto exported to the to the to the, the place on DL.fpo. Then there should be no reason that that doesn't just happen all the time. Yeah. Well, and I was suggesting that we do it against the nightlies, and if that's too much for Fedora folks, then we could do that. I'm sure someone would offer space. I might even be able to offer space to do that. But it'd be great to do it against the nightlies so that we always have like yeah. a sense of where things are going. But Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, Jimmy. That, that, that's that would be my Diane question. Members. Is is what what what's stopping us from from doing that? Like, is is it just because that would be for me one one way to really showcase um, the OKD working group um, to stepping up and doing that um, externally to the Red Hat engineering and maybe um, being able to showcase some of the work that that you're doing at Dato or whomever ends up hosting it too. So. Um, is there something I don't missing? think either of I don't think either of us at Data would actually have a problem about helping set that up, even within the auspices of the Fedora project. Both Dan and I are actually members of the Fedora community as well, and so yeah. we can, if we were doing it, I expect that even if Data were like doing some of the effort to make this happen, we'd probably want to drive it so that it's actually executed within Fedora, um, so that it isn't it isn't gated on us like we are not we don't own it and, and it's something that can be shared upon with the rest of the community and sure we'll we'll probably make it in a way that lets us also build it internally for our own cases as well but we we certainly want to make it so that it is a public resource that is supported well um that way so one of the things this actually leads into one of the things i put on the agenda for the crc discussion is does this necessitate or does this lead us to having a subgroup that is CRC and have a page that is and that's not in someone else's repo in our repo the C, the CRC build process a link to scripts OKD working group maintains those scripts etc we get feedback from uh, data we get feedback from Fedora etc but ultimately it stays within the working group as a project that working group members can actually keep alive. So um, I mean, that makes sense to me. That's what I would expect it to be. If, yeah. if whoever whoever is like the the scripts to build the software should be versioned with the software. That that is that is the absolute right sense uh, in, in my opinion. So if that's if that's this working group, if that's like, yeah, I think it's, it's I think it's this working group. And I, what I would like to see also is maybe a page showing how folks can do their own automation for their provider, right? Exactly, like like so whatever wherever if they've got a Jenkins set up uh, in AWS or in another OKD cluster or wherever they have it, like to be able to to set it up with Jenkins or. Um, uh, Tecton, or you know, whatever you've got. Like, it'd be nice to have some examples of how to do that in all of yeah, those that's a, automation providers. That's a good point. If the configuration for that becomes run this script that's already in the repo that that does the things, then yeah, yeah. agreed. Yeah. 
All right. Well, let's. Uh, I'm interested in participating in that. It sounds Neil and, and Daniel, you seem uh, interested in that. Daniel, do you prefer Daniel or Dan? By the way. Um. Either one. Okay. Doesn't uh, doesn't matter. Not Danny, and, but and Dan or Daniel. Daniel's fine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you had to specify. I was gonna say. So does that mean Danny's fine too? <laughs> So, so, Jamie, I, I guess one question I've got, what is the execution environment for this? Because looking at the playthrough, it seemed to be run on libvert within sort of a workstation environment. I didn't get the sense it was potentially something that could run within cluster. So it, is it going to be running against a vSphere or an overt or a... Cause I, yes. I, I, I think... <laughs> like, yeah, so... So yeah, it, could I say something? Oh, let, sorry, Bruce. I, I know you a while back you were going to say something. Yeah, go ahead. I was on the list. Yeah, no, I, I tried it, uh, and it, it, uh, uh, it, it looks like he's going with latest, latest of everything, uh, and it almost worked. It got it, it got up to uh, where all of the class, all of the operators came up except for DNS and authentication, uh, and, and then it died and. Uh, it, it, I ran it on a, uh, a, a NUC, uh, you know, I-10, uh, which was more, I already had sitting there, which is more or less uh, CentOS stream, which he was using. So uh, his script is quite clear. Uh, I didn't have a chance to go through and figure out why it didn't go up, but I'm guessing that, uh, like, there was a lot of stuff where you can't use the latest FCOS uh, and there were other people had overt problems. So I'm guessing that that was one of the reasons why the networking had some hiccup that didn't cause DNS to come up. Um, yeah, Bruce, just to let you know, Vadim put a comment on an issue three days ago where they've dropped back to the previous FCOS. So if you use one of the newer nightlies, right. you may get a better result. Uh, yeah, no, I, I saw that. And uh, that seems to be a recurrent theme, which is a bit annoying. Uh, because it, it, it means that a lot of the installations and or upgrades, uh, I, I, I've gone to the point where I don't expect it to work out of the box. Uh, and a year ago, uh, for a long time, maybe six months, uh, things did work out of the box. Uh, ba basically, I think that was back when we were, when uh, FCOS was uh, version 32. Um, but and I think uh, a question for Vadim might be how is it how are these slipping through uh, their process to where these aren't building successfully when theoretically I mean maybe they're not using the stable next and um, the third stream that FCOS provides to test all of these iterations but ideally they should or we should right we should be right. setting up uh, an automation that tests against all these FCOS versions coming down. I don't yeah, know well, that was one, one of my thoughts was that. that, all. that uh, sorry. I don't know when it when it Neil? comes to OpenShift yeah. development, I don't think they're doing anything against FCOS at all, which is probably no. They're, they're actually doing it against CentOS, right? Yeah. Right, and that's that's where the impedance problems are. Like, yeah. uh, yeah. if they're not simultaneously testing every commit landing into uh, into OpenShift on both RCOS and FCOS, then this starts falling apart a lot. Right. Sorry, Bruce, did you have anything else? Uh, yeah, no, I, I was just going to say that uh, uh, with a lot of the scripting, it probably would help to expose the the choices of uh, FCOS as well as uh, OKD version so that you just don't hard code pulling the latest of the, of the latest. Uh, because then, then when you if you just run the script as Charles is, uh, you don't a priori know what you're necessarily getting. Uh, yeah. So I mean that that's sort of a minor probably change. As I say, I haven't had a chance. It takes about six hours to run through the building the cluster uh, on a NUC with his configuration. Okay. Uh, so it's not something that you can, from a time standpoint, easily just sort of make a change. Right. Clean it up, try another thing. Clean it up, try another thing. Uh, but it's it's uh, notwithstanding all the things that you might think is negative, it's actually pretty good. It, it came close, you know, to to working. Uh, so I was actually hopeful. 
Well, let's let's throw a lot of resources at it. So let's actually get together a group of folks. I'll send an email to the working group mailing list that said, hey, if there's anyone else interested in joining this CRC subgroup, um, and then let's go from there. Let's just, okay, so Neil, Daniel, Bruce, sounds like you're interested. Let's just tackle it, throw what resources we have. I've got a box that I can test it on, do some automation. We'll start a repo, and let's just run with it and see where it goes. And anyone that's interested can jump on. And I think this is great because this would be the first, other than the documentation, um, th this will be the first technical project related to the OKD work. And I think that that's a great rallying point because it gives people something tangible that they can really uh, bite into in terms of their participation and whatnot, technical participation. And as we know, uh, small single node clusters, home labs, et cetera, are like the, the, the sweet spot. There's so many questions of the OKD uh, in the OKD community about, can I run this at home? Can I run this? Can I do single node, et cetera? And so this sort of answers uh, a lot of things in the community, I think. Diane, everything okay? <laughs> nobody was hurt. <laughs> no, nobody was hurt. That's all that counts. So, okay. Yes. Apologies. All right. Guys. Any any last uh, thoughts on the CRC stuff? Um, all right. So we'll get a repo up. Uh, and um, Daniel, uh, if you want... Um, Put your email uh, and your Git name uh, in the document. Uh, Neil, I think we already have yours on some some stuff, uh, but I'll make sure that you get added on um, Bruce as well. Brian, you have any interest in this, or are you are you uh, tax uh, maxed out right now? No, I'm I'm, I'm interested in this as well. Okay, uh, and if anyone else is on the call, if you want to just type your name in the channel, if you happen to be on the call and you're interested in CRC. Uh, subgroup and doing some technical work, uh, feel free to throw your uh, your Git name in there and we'll work with that. So did okay. you want it in the HackMD document, in the chat? Uh, put it in the HackMD document, yeah. Okay. That'd be easiest because we lose the chat when we close uh, the meeting, so. Unless we specifically save it. Uh, okay, so OKD operator catalogs, I can't really ask these. Um, I, was, I was hoping for Vadim or Christian to chime in. Um, and uh, just to reiterate, this was, I want to find out who at Red Hat we can bug about this internal effort to get some of the operators, like the logging operator and pipelines and whatnot. Supposedly, there's an effort within Red Hat to get these opened up, get the Red Hat versions actually opened up and available as opposed to using, you know, Tekton or using... There is, and um, the operator framework is a CNCF project too, um, and they have community meetings so that maybe um, what I need to do is, is show up there with this as an agenda item um, with, you know, one or two of you um, in there. So um, put a note in there um, to find out when the next community meeting is for the operator framework in the notes, and um, maybe Jamie and I or somebody and I can show up there and or and see what we can do to, to move that forward because um, is, is this going to be a community operator because I mean there is already the community operator hub community repo I yeah. thought this was going to be an OKD it is repo. but they but there is we need some more clarity around the Red Hat supported ones and most of the folks that are working in the operator framework um, community are those engineers so um, and we can also ask the questions in um, in the uh, the kubernetes in the, the I think it's in CNCF slack there's a slack channel for operator framework but we can track that down and, and start asking those questions because they are they they just did a couple of an update the week before last on the operator SDK and um, I, I didn't bring up okD um, but uh, they they are doing a lot of thinking about this. I'm not sure where they're doing the work around it, but they're thinking about it. Yeah, there is an operator SDK group, operator SDK dev, mm -hmm. but possibly it. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at that, and then um, it would be great to get some clarity on that, because we have that 
one issue that lists all of the operators and they're sort of broken up by the three categories. So we have that, it'd be nice to get some clarity on where that top category of like, the ones that were sort of waiting to get addressed are. Um, and then the other thing that I have on the agenda here is where can the community start? How can we inspire folks that are asking about these operators on OKD to build themselves or recruit people or recruit people to get these properly tested on OKD so that they can get added in. Um, anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm sure I'm supposed to have thoughts on that, um, but I don't have the answers on that one. And that's why I would move over and ask on the OKD, uh, not the OKD, the operator SDK group and the operator framework groups there because that's where the engineering resources are right now. Um, so I think originally we had a few of them coming over and filtering into our group and then they created their own community. So they're over there. Um, so if we want stuff on OKD, I think we need to go to them. Can I ask a I related question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the, because uh, I, I was, uh, uh, I went through and uh, was about to update an operator that I was using for one of my classes. Uh, and then it, it turned out that uh, uh, I noticed that it is, since I updated to a recent 4.7 from 4.6, uh, my operator was now uh, controlled by the samples operator. Uh, and so, of course, it wiped out my update. Uh, because it was inconsistent with its status. And I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, and, and then it occurred to me, well, okay, uh, we maybe should have a mechanism for updating like things like the samples operator separate from the main update of everything. Because it's a bit hazardous to update your entire cluster, and there might be some subcomponents that were less risky that you might want to update in the middle, uh, you know, in between doing a major update. And I don't think we have that sort of mechanism at the moment. No, no. Okay, so um, that's, that's sort of my question, just throwing out that idea is that it would be useful from an operational standpoint. I think that's good. Let's put that actually in the document um, under operators. Um, Bruce, go ahead and type that. Do you got the document open if you want? Go ahead and type uh, it. Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay, do thanks. it under the, right where you see my cursor for operator catalog stuff. Um, I think that's a great question. I think that's something that we can ask, you know, from an engineering standpoint, um, moving forward, like what types of options are there for that? Uh, okay, anything else on operators before we move on to uh, new business stuff? We've got about 12 minutes left, so I want to keep us, keep us on time. All right, let's move on then to uh, new business stuff. So migration path outline. Um, that's something that we're going to want to work on with, between um, maybe Vadim and the documentation group is a, a document that shows, you know, if you're at such and such version, you can go to such and such version. Uh, here are some issues that you might have, uh, et cetera. Um, this is going to be on the agenda for the next docs meeting next week. Um, so if you have anything you want to chip in on that, um, feel free to send something to the, to the mailing group. Um, the working groups, mailing group, uh, user group, and um, uh, we'll be sure to include it in that discussion or join us for the docs meeting. Same bat time, same bat channel, just next Tuesday. Um, so the next thing I wanted to throw out is what do people think about a user questionnaire? Getting a sense of, for the folks that are using it, what are they using it for? How do they, where do they, it, theoretically we have lots of, I don't remember the number that Vadim gave, but theoretically we have lots of folks installing OKD. Does anyone think it would be worthwhile to get, uh, to put a, just a questionnaire out there and then promote it in the channel and the mailing list and whatever? And... If we came up with some, you know, two or three questions, really basic ones, um, what, what are your workloads? What version of OKD are you running? You know, what's your, I don't know, like if you could come up with what they are, we could host um, a link to the, this survey ongoing. Um, I would love to know that um, without, you know, people who, you know, 
invading people's um, privacy or GDPR stuff. I'm always curious about that. I've done a few in the past um, that haven't gotten a lot of feedback, shall we say, um, other than probably the, the group of you guys who are all on here right now. Thank you very much. Um, but like at, um, we could do something at Commons um, and with the Commons mailing list, I'm trying to, um, I'm just about to launch an end user page for that. And I really would like to know um, who's got OKD running, who's got OCP running, Rosa, but a lot of that is um, competitive secrets or whatever um, folks think. So anything we can do to find out and familiarize us ourselves with that. I have a sneaking suspicion that there's a lot more people than um, Rody and Schwartz and uh, uh, Market America using it in enterprise production than um, we suspect. Um, and I think that's what Vadim's data shows us. So asking them what their workloads are would be really cool um, and getting more of them to showcase that. But also I think there's a huge a folks, a group of folks using it in home labs um, and, and doing, and the CRC stuff is gonna be of, of interest to them and others. So um, yeah, I, I'd be happy to help shape that. Um, and if you guys have suggestions for questions, maybe we can create an issue or a discussion point and people could in the comments um, help develop, like, I'd say limit it to like five questions, if we can, max, and then um, we can socialize it as a poll at the Commons event at KubeCon on the, on the landing page and give it like a three-month period of the survey is open, and at the end of the survey, we could do the state of OKD, sort of like the Octoverse, the OKDverse or something like that report would be cool. I like it. Does yeah, anyone else have thoughts on that? I like the the idea of the OKD verse. I'll create a discussion item, and then if folks have ideas, uh, go ahead and, and chip it into the discussion. And yeah, I think you're right, Diane. Um, just a handful of questions, no more than like six. Like that mm -hmm. would be the absolute max. You don't want to overwhelm people so that they keep putting it off. You want something that like it's in front of them, like oh yeah, I can do this real quick and just put it in my. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Um, and let's see if there's, a, oh, and one thing I wanted to point out, uh, there's clearly people that have interests. So for example, the OKD working group meeting has the video from the last meeting uh, has 97 views so far and it was posted like just the other day. Clearly there are people who are at least interested in what we're doing and what's going on. So it'd be nice to to bring new people into the fold and to find out the people who are currently using it, like what they're doing. Um, that might inform us getting more folks involved. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Oh yeah, Diane uh, Kupka. Yeah, so um, yeah, and this is just, if you're listening out there on the recording and you're going to KubeCon, let me know. Um, I'd love to connect with you there, create a space for the OKD folks to meet there, um, at either on the 12th of October. We are going to try and do an OKD office hours during KubeCon. Um, uh, and, you know, I, the CNCF is still mustering through and saying we're going to be there in person. I personally cannot be, go there because I'm up in Canada. And um, uh, there's not, there's just a, a little border between us and you. and um, that they're, they're keeping it pretty stringent. Um, so I'm going to be hosting the virtual side of KubeCon um, and um, the Commons, so I'll be online all the time. Um, but we do have a space available on the 12th for a meeting if people are there. Um, and we will do a, a live streamed um, office hour then, which I will get myself organized and invite you all to again. Excellent. From the looks uh, of all, all of your faces, it doesn't look like anybody here is going to be there in person. Yeah, no. Uh, no, I'm having a small child. Uh, he just turned one uh, yeah. on July 31st. He can't get vaccinated, so I'm sort of by default cannot go to any large. Uh... Yeah, no, I totally understand, and I'm not asking people to go. I'm just. Uh, let's see here. Oh, speaking of, of events, Diane, do you have a sense of when we want to do another um, uh, office hours? During, well, I was going to wait until it's seven weeks out um, to do one during KubeCon North America week. 
So um, I'll work with Chris Short and um, Josh Burke as are managing the office hours for all the different community groups. And so OKD is on their radar. So hopefully I can nudge them to give us a date and a time and socialize it. And we can see which one of you wonderful people will be there. And maybe Brian, by then we will have the OKD site migrated over to a real world um, MK docs thing. And we can shout about it and invite people to find our grammar errors. <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. I, I got something I think I quite, quite like to ask. Um, <clears throat> Diane, you sort of host a number of communities, including the Key, which I know you guys call Quay. Um, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> is there any chance of doing like a collaboration with them on getting it running on OKD? Because I think that'd be a really good thing to have a a sort of a, a, a private registry. Um, and it's not an easy process out of the box on OKD, but with the operator on OpenShift, it's a couple of button clicks and you get the whole stack there. So I'm just wondering, can we actually do a collab with we them could. to try and come together and actually get it? I know we've got to do storage to get that working before we can put the, the, yep. the sort of repo on there, but I think that, that would be a really good so, concrete step and it moves our operator story that a little bit further on as well. Yep. So um, I have, I'm going to do the outreach to the OCM folks, get us there. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to do some outreach to the operator framework folks and get us there and collab there. I think uh, the remainder of 2021 and going into 2022 should just be uh, more collabs you know, um, and figure out how to, how to extend um, awareness of OKD and um, to make sure that OKD works with all these other folks and takes advantage of that. And the Quay folks, I actually um, started out managing their community and they have um, moved and um, we, we get a couple of things. And so hopefully, um, and they have community meetings too. So there's nothing precluding any of us from going to their meetings, um, but maybe we could, um, you know, I'll, I'll put that in my notes too and then see if we can't move that one forward too um and just if brian if you're interested what i'll do is i'll try and find the date and forward it to you for the next meeting and if i can get there and you can get there we can talk about it and you can tell them what you need okay that'll be good all right guys all right anything else any last minute thoughts we've got two minutes if there's anything else you've got no all right thanks all everybody right. Thanks for putting up with the noise in the background and the crashes and stuff. Eventually, right. it'll Talk be done. Soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye, Thanks, all.